We are recording this on Friday, January 26th at 7.49 p.m. This might be relevant. This is an episode where that information could be relevant. (laughs) This is a very special episode of the Jen Fulweiler Show. I wish we had prepared some very special episode music, you know, like in the (laughs) after school specials in the 90s, you know, be like this is or, or sometimes there would be a sitcom where it would be like Family Ties or Full House. And normally it was a comedy, but sometimes you'd have this sentimental piano music (laughs) and it was like, this is the one where they learn, you know, that sex is bad or something (laughs) like it's, it suddenly it gets serious. This is, this is that episode of the Jen Fulweiler show because (laughs) I just got out of the ER. Uh, I have a, I have a report from the ER here that it, I, I'm trying not to show my social security number, but see, this is like, what do I have to do to get you people on YouTube? Uh, <laughs> this is really fine print here, and my social security number and date of birth might be on this. And you, you guys, you're still <laughs> not going to go to my YouTube channel, JF on YouTube.com. But let let me just look at this here. We've got um, it's a radiologist report. The radiologist looked at this and and did this diagnosis at 3.46 p.m. today in the ER, and it is now 7.50 p.m. So, I mean, this is, we just have a lot going on on this podcast. (laughs) And so I'll tell you, I'll tell you my diagnosis and why I'm doing this podcast episode anyway. Um, I have a deep vein thrombosis, and those are always serious, but I, I have an especially serious one it, it goes, it's above my knee and it goes just the whole, the whole length of my leg. And I have long legs, I have very long legs. I can't buy pants that fit to save my <laughs> life. So uh, this is, you know, I get like extra credit when I have a DVT that goes the whole way into my leg. Um, and the reason we're laughing is because if it breaks off, I'll die in seconds. <laughs> and Live like on air. <laughs> my, Caitlin, if I die during this episode, you have to still publish. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> finally, I'd be up there in purgatory. Like, <laughs> finally, we have some views to this YouTube channel. It cost me my life, but honestly, worth it. Like, that's what you have to do. <laughs> Literally what you have to do to get views on YouTube. Um, so <laughs> we'd ha- we had planned to do the podcast. And... I just thought I'm just going to do it anyway, because I I think that one of the things that happened today, this diagnosis was completely from God, completely from God. And that is why I I decided to do this podcast episode. Anyway, we are scrapping the material that I had, and I'm doing this podcast because I think there is a lesson here that you guys need to know that might be helpful to you. Uh, and, and I wanted to share that story with you as well as the stories from the ER, from the waiting room. I was there six hours. If I had spent 20 years as a carny in the circus, I don't think I would have as many rich and colorful stories as I do from the ER today. I want to go back. <laughs> six hours wasn't enough. They became my village. They became my community. So I'm going to tell you those stories. And then also, uh, I guess in the second half of the show, we'll make this the main topic, is how I got diagnosed and what we all can learn from it. And if you live like Jen lives, you might not end up dying from weird stuff because the reality is I'm probably going to be fine. But if I had not listened to God and my gut instinct, I really think that in the next few months, I might have dropped dead of this blood clot breaking free. And then you guys wouldn't have new podcast episodes. So that's, it's very serious. Um, And I'm going to prevent you from ending up in similar situations. You guys are going to start living like I live so that God can actually work in your lives instead of like being controlling and blocking out the voice of God. I'm going to have everyone converted to Catholicism (laughs) by the end of this episode. I actually don't know what being Catholic had to do with that, but I do (laughs) feel like I got some bonus points. I feel like I got some God bonus points for the Catholic thing. Um, So I'm, I'm sitting here with a really serious DVT. Uh, I am on blood thinners uh, just (laughs) diagnosed fresh out of the, fresh out of the ER. Uh, You again, you can see on YouTube, this is the sweatshirt fresh out of Seton. Fresh out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fresh out of Seton. Yeah, exactly. Just fresh out of Seton. Exactly. Um, 
<laughs> Fresh out of Scott and White. That's yeah. right. These Scott and White streets. <laughs> uh, exactly. Oh. So a uh, very different episode for today. Very different episode. Welcome to the Jen Fulbiler Show. If this is your first episode, boy, are you in for a wild ride. <laughs> if you just discovered this podcast, this is normally the podcast where you learn the art of the village hustle. That's being a hot girl, girl boss who knows that love and family and community are the foundations of all true success. Today, you'll learn how to stay alive <laughs> by listening to your gut instinct and not putting stupid rules on yourself that don't need to be there. Um, I am your host, Jen. I am currently alive, which, you know, this is touch and go. We'll see. <laughs> by the way, by the time this episode is out, it will be clear whether I'm going to live or die. The <laughs> blood thinners will have. But you don't need to worry if you check my Instagram right now and I'm still alive, that I'm fine. Um, I should really <laughs> make sure to update my Instagram yeah. stories Wednesday morning. Um, if I make it to Wednesday, we're fine. Yeah, I'm totally. I mean, I'm going to be fine either way, but I'll be more fine if I'm like still alive on Wednesday. Okay, so um, so I, I'm your host, currently alive as of Friday, January 26th at 7.55 p.m. Um, Jen, I have six kids. Uh, I had six babies in eight years. Yeah, I, have a, I have a blood clotting disorder called factor two, oh. not factor five, because I'm not basic. I'm not <laughs> I'm not like these go basic <laughs> bees, you know, with their factor five. Like, no, factor two and homozygous, meaning it's a rare disorder that I got from both parents. So I don't know if my parents met at a family reunion <laughs> or how that happened. But somehow I have both copies of this gene. Uh, I My parents are evidently not telling me something because there's like you nobody nobody is homozygous for a factor two but i am that's not normally what i say in the podcast introduction uh, i'm jen best-selling author stand-up comic mom of six uh caitlin white is our lovely producer do remember her last name that's going to come into a story i have to tell oh, yeah. from the er caitlin white is our lovely producer and we are constantly publishing hot fire premium content on patreon we're very involved in the patreon we both love it caitlin is the patreon community manager and um, you can sign up and help me pay my medical bills by <laughs> my ever mounting medical bill. do you know what a ct scan costs Ooh. yeah yeah. Uh, so uh, join my Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com slash this is Jen. The link is in the show notes. Uh, no, it's fine. Otherwise, I'll just be like living in my car, um, you know, d dying of a, of a DVT that's about to break off. It, it's but, but don't <laughs> j just because I'm about to die. Don't feel like, oh, you have to join my Patreon. Like, I mean, would it be your fault? Like if something happened to me and you didn't you join know, the Patreon, maybe you know. I mean, well, can we say, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe. but I far be it from me to use a medical crisis <laughs> to get people to sign up for my Patreon. I would never, never do that. I'm just saying that patreon.com slash this is Jen is the uh, <laughs> website for it. Okay. So, um, I, I, so in the second half, I will get to how I got diagnosed and how it was one hundred percent a god thing but i want to start by just well first of all okay hang on i i, I want to start by saying name a podcast host who is more on their grind name a podcast host who has better earned the phrase the grind never stops <laughs> are the other podcasters you follow doing their podcast three hours after being diagnosed with a deep vein thrombosis. I, I oh, don't nope. Name another one. So take that. Hey, ice bath bros, <laughs> your move, your move. You guys get diagnosed with a very serious deep vein thrombosis. I, I don't know what you would do, but it wouldn't be an entire podcast episode immediately <laughs> after you step out of the ER. Mm -mm. That We know what a trillionaire grind set looks like over here. I'm not letting... You know, did DVT and imminent death <laughs> stop me <laughs> from doing this episode? Um, so uh, let me start by telling you about what I just witnessed in this ER. <laughs> Sometimes when something inconvenient happens, and this was very inconvenient, I had many other things to be doing today other than spending six hours in an ER. Um, sometimes... God sends you on these tangents just for the people that you encounter. I think I had a few interactions today 
that that might have been encouraging to people, might have been helpful to them. Certainly, I was on the receiving end of of some encouragement. So mm-hmm. I I got there at like eleven forty five, and I left. When did I get back here, Kate? It was like six like thirty, right? Almost seven. Yeah. 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 So I mean, but I I I am I yearn for these people. I actually. We bonded so much in this ER waiting room. I'm j- I want to go back. I don't even want to be here. I want to go back <laughs> to the ER waiting room and just see how some of these plot lines played out. Okay. So, where do I even begin? First of all, you need to know something about the modern healthcare system. Uh, and it, this is not going to turn into a rant about the healthcare system because I, I don't have any solutions. I don't know how to fix it. I, I don't know what to say. This is I'm not making any statements about the healthcare system. It just is what it is. Every country has healthcare problems. And um this ER was such a disaster. If you were to go to an ER in a rural area of a war-torn country that was actively experiencing a coup, you would get way better service than this emergency room was able to offer uh so <laughs> th- i i kid you not hand on my bible app this happened this man walks in <laughs> he looks gray and pale he says i i'm really having trouble breathing i'm very short of breath i have chest pains and then i have pain radiating all down my left arm they're like fill out this paperwork and take a seat <laughs> he said yeah i Let me put this a different way. I think I'm having a heart attack. They said, fill out this paperwork and take a seat. At this point, I'd been in this waiting room for a while and I was texting stories to the family group chat. And I said, uh, so I noted the time. I said, okay, when this guy checked in, it was 2.40. I got called back for for my CT scan at 3.12 and the guy was still, he was still waiting. Oh my goodness. They, and no one had seen him. No one had evaluated him. Nothing. Then earlier, there was a, a 15-year-old kid came in from the high school. His dad brought him in during uh, during like school hours. His arm was so disgusting. It He Ooh. had broken it. And it, it was red. It was, I mean, it was broken. It was like you almost vomited just looking at his arm. This kid was, you know, cold sweats, like just cold sweat dripping down his face. He was screaming. He was crying. Um, they, again, they were like, fill out paperwork, take a seat. 20 minutes go by. The dad is like, can we can we just get him started on pain medication or just anything? They're like, no. They call all of these people in front of him who are like smiling, whistling their way into the ER. His dad goes up and is like, uh, this is kind of serious. Mm-hmm. Could we prioritize him? After 45 minutes of waiting, his dad is like, dude, what do you do you see his arm? Like, do you see like this kid is sobbing? I kid you not. The hostile man at the front desk said to his father, he he rolled his eyes, first of all, and then he said to this kid's father, pain won't kill you. Uh, (laughs) What? What I wanted to do, and I hate myself for not doing, I wanted to jump over all the chairs in the ER, go to that front desk, take a stapler, like smash this guy's face with it, break his nose, and then be like, pain won't kill you. And then make him wait in line. (laughs) Make him wait in line to be like, hey, please, sir, sir, we have a process. We have a process. Pain won't kill you. Pain won't kill you. I I was in there to be evaluated for pulmonary embolisms, which, by the way, I don't have just a DVT, so I'm living large over here. (laughs) Pulmonary embolisms are like, you can die in seconds mm-hmm. if you have. The, it's very serious. Normally, you get bumped. Oh, by the way, that's another thing. I'm talking about the guy with the heart attack, the kid with the broken arm. I, I walked in. I said, I have a history of deep vein thrombosis, um, a history of bilateral pulmonary embolisms, um, and a clotting disorder. I'm not currently on blood thinners, um, and I'm, I'm very short of breath suddenly. They're like, take a seat. Takes it. Now, to me, they couldn't be like blood clots in the lungs won't kill you because they will. So they yeah. they're like, we just don't care. Um, so they actually could, but we don't care. So when my turn came, I tried to give it to the kid. They called my name and I was like, 
this kid is in a lot of pain. Can you, I'll just wait, I'll sit back down. Can you take this kid in? And they were like, there is a process, ma'am. Oh, good Lord. Okay, so at this point, the whole waiting room just like staged a revolution. Like, I mean, every way, that, that was the breaking point. So they just did a quick intake and then I was back out in the waiting room. So I saw the the result of this revolution. When I came back out, everyone was talking like the, you know, normally when you're in a waiting room, people don't really talk to each other. They don't make eye contact, stuff like that. Um, that wall had been broken down. Everyone was like, I'll call this urgent care. They were, they were like doling out responsibilities. This one woman was kind of the manager of it all. She's like, okay, I'll call Scott and White. You guys call Seton. Then I got involved. I was like, I'll call Austin Regional Clinic. Sometimes they can make uh, like last minute appointments. Mm-hmm. They can get people in just to see a regular doctor, not even ER. We were all, I, and then <laughs> I, I didn't say this only because some the, some other people were, were trying to talk to the guy, but I actually thought I was thinking like, okay, <clears throat> I'm in comedy. Um, not all of my comedy friends are walking with the Lord. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is it if you really need some pain meds, you know, I might I mean, I might be able to make a call. I I might be able to get this done, you know. Um <laughs> I thought about if you and I said, oh, Jen, you're being crazy. If you had seen the amount of pain this kid was in, I, I, I almost thought about it. Like, like, just somebody get down here with something because this you can't see a child suffering mm-hmm. like that and not start getting real creative. I, I actually thought if I had any old prescriptions at home, I seriously would have called my husband and been like, can you bring this down to the ER? <laughs> it, it was It was so terrible. It was so painful. Okay, so from that point, Everyone in the ER, is, we're just like openly chatting and talking. And then, uh, okay, so there was this, there was this woman, just the best woman I've ever encountered in my life. Uh, okay, imagine if Lizzo was not quite as felt as she is, a um, little heavier, uh, with a with the huge just gorgeous the most perfect dyed red afro you've ever seen this woman I like as soon as I saw her I was like she has to be my life coach I love this woman's energy so let's let's call her red I never got her name but we're going to call her red because she had that awesome dyed red hair she's now my favorite person I will think of her every day until I die which <laughs> could be tomorrow <laughs> I'm kidding I'm kidding I'm going to be fine by the time this episode airs you know, I mean, if my Instagram stories aren't updated, guys, I'm <laughs> then I'm you kidding. can. Worry. I'm kidding. Listen, <laughs> very unlikely that anything <clears throat> would happen. Okay, so um, Red, we'll call her Red. So she would just sort of randomly shout things at people sometimes, and she'd mentioned that she'd been to the ER many times, some sometimes for mental health concern and 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 other things. So she was kind of like the. Um, she was like the the person who's been around the block. She became kind of our guardian and our mentor. Um, and so she would just kind of randomly shout things at people. And and like uh, at one point, she turned to the woman next to her that just apropos of nothing, she was like, my grandmother's here. And um, the woman said like, oh, to hear she's like, she was, uh, she did intake. And the woman's like, no, on earth. And so that's the kind of conversations <laughs> that she was starting. Just wanted to let her know that, that her grandmother was on earth. Okay, so remember, remember Red. Um, so I'm sitting there. I have my laptop. You know, I, I knew how this was going to go. So I brought my laptop. I'm trying to work. So then Red starts yelling that there's someone outside. There was a man outside whose, whose wife was like, having a baby like having a baby like she couldn't walk and so he is like yelling and screaming so red because she just sort of like works for the hospital at this point (laughs) because they weren't really doing their jobs she walks up and she's like she's like these people need help so they go outside and the woman comes in um and and is like screaming in labor i mean i think the baby was like crowning i mean this it, we were at the end stages of labor here so the this girl she's probably like 22 couldn't walk so she's like screaming her husband runs out to to just park the car and then so then red stays with her and is like kind of praying over but that her but then also kind of saying random stuff invoking her grandmother who's 
on earth, but not, you know, I mean, just really saying some random stuff. <laughs> the woman's screaming. And then the intake woman comes out and is making this woman fill out paperwork. And when the woman oh had a suggestion for what the intake woman could do with her pen that she was trying to make her fill out the forms, the intake woman was like, okay, well, I can fill it out for you. So, like, huh. you know, just give me your name. So this woman is like screaming in agony, spelling her last name like M. E <laughs> N. And then once again, all of us, um, all of the the waiting room folk, which is, I mean, that just became my identity. You know, your your village becomes your identity. I was like, I'm just a waiting room person now. I mean, this is my whole life. This is my community. And so the women, we were all looking at each other, like, you know, do we should we be doulas for her? You know, should we get involved? <laughs> okay, so she's screaming. Red is like kind of praying over her, also kind of standing there. And then occasionally she would talk to the people and ask, and tell them about new phantom medical concerns that she thought she might have. <laughs> but she's also kind of in the way of the woman who's in labor. I kid you not, a man with one arm comes skipping out, skipping and smiling, biggest smile on his face I've seen. I haven't seen someone smile like that in years. A man with one arm comes skipping through the room, weaves in between Red and the woman screaming in labor, and then skips back through to another door of the ER. He was not an employee. He had a band t-shirt on, smiling one arm. So random. <laughs> I never saw that man again. He's it, it, like, how much chaos does that like? What what does the one armed man have to do with the plot? This is so crazy. So the woman, um, so she got seen. So that's what I that's what I learned is like if you want to be seen by ER people at a busy ER, um, having a visibly mangled arm will not get you seen. Um, gasping for breath within a very obvious heart attack will not get you seen labor will get you seen i i guess because uh -huh. that one could be kind of messy you yeah. know <laughs> they're like this could be a lot of cleanup for us whereas if this guy just drops dead of a heart attack you know we'll we just, just kind of screwed him, him off to the side but if you know if her water breaks in this er then we have to clean it up so she actually got seen so they sent her back so the um so the kid with the broken arm goes back as i go back and because uh, I, I went back multiple times. So this this is one of the times I go back. So they're trying to do intake with me. And it turns out that the the medical student who was with the doctor who was seeing me is a med student at Texas A&M. And my son is at Texas A&M. And this guy seemed really nice. And so I just I wanted to chat with him. But the kid with the broken arm is screaming in agony next to us. I, I do think he was being helped. And long story short, I mean, I think I think the kid is okay. They finally helped him. They were able to help him. But in that moment, you know, they were evaluating him and he was screaming. And so I'm trying to make conversation with this kid who's at A&M, but then this poor kid is screaming. And it's so hard as a mom not to go get involved mm -hmm. and start like yelling at ER people and telling them how to do their <laughs> jobs, which I absolutely shouldn't do, but it was very tempting. So then um, with this kid like screaming right next to me, um, the doctor said to me, she, she was like, she referred to her her med student. Is I had a great conversation with him. His name is R. Bob. I I love him. I'm so ready for him to like be my doctor in the future. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful kid, R. Bob. And um, so she was like, um, so we need to start an IV for the CT scan because they they inject dye into your veins. And she said, um. I'm just going to have my med student do it here. She, it, and, and then he says, he's like, I've never done it, but I've seen it done a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I am a people-pleasing, non-confrontational person to a fault. I have told you guys about the time I thought someone was stalking me. They were following me very closely. And I ended up just going to my ho house because I felt rude Um like not letting them just come to my house and kill me. It just felt like that was not good etiquette <laughs> to um, just let them come to my house and kill me. That That is how much of a people pleaser I am. Uh, turns out it was just some, I don't know, someone just tailgating me for no reason. But um, that I, I'm a people pleaser to an extreme degree. And I have often thought there is almost nothing that could get me to stand up for myself in the moment. <laughs> Today I found it. Found it. 
<laughs> when someone says, I've never started an IV, but I've seen it done. And then when the doctor was starting it, she was, have you guys seen the Drake gif from one of his songs where, where Drake is like, let me see if I can find this where Drake is, he's showing someone something and they're like, oh, oh, yes. Oh, that's so, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting. Um, that was, that was when, when she was showing him how to, um, oh, I can't find the gift. It's so funny. It's like, it's two guys sitting in front of a computer and, and Drake is, you know, like showing him. So, so she's, <laughs> she's showing him the vein. She's like, so what you do is you insert the needle. You don't want to go any higher because when you insert the needle here, if, if you insert it in the other place, it can kind of like puncture through. And he's like, oh, good to know. And I'm thinking like, <laughs> ah, ah, like, ah, like, and then it felt more painful just thinking about what I almost <laughs> just experienced. Um, and so I just felt like such a girl boss. I was like, I'm unstoppable. I, and again, like th this guy is my new best friend. I love him so much, but d he didn't need to be starting an IV in, in my, in my arm. And I just feel like such a girl boss. I'm like, Haha, I insisted that the doctor start my IV. So I just, I can't lose. Like I am a powerful woman. Um, so, so then, okay. So then they start the IV and then like with most of the patients, you, you have to imagine this in this ER waiting room, almost all of us had IVs in our arms. And if you've ever seen IVs, they're kind of bloody. Blood spills out of them. So all of us have IVs in our arms with all of this like blood around. <laughs> and we're just sitting there in this ER. And um, so, so I go back there, you know, just I'm typing on my computer. So then I witnessed the most iconic thing I will ever see anyone do. This woman, Red, was sitting there and the finance woman came up with her clipboard to get her payment. And you know how hospitals, will do, they will just rob people blind. They'll tell them these exorbitant numbers. And I just felt bad for her. She, Red seemed like a low income person. And I, I just, I felt bad for her for what was about to happen. So the finance woman with the clipboard comes up and Red says, hold on, I need to call my mama and pray. <laughs> she picked up her phone. She was like, mama, mama, we need to pray. We need to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for this emergency room. Yeah, and then her mother would say something. She'd be like, yes, mama. <laughs> yes. Yes, mama. She'd be like, we, we thank you. We thank you for the pens. We thank you for she, th this lady. What, what's your name, ma'am? And the woman with the clipboard was like, you know, Katie. She said, we thank you for Katie. We thank you. And then the clipboard woman was like, um, excuse me, ma'am, <laughs> ma'am, I need to get your payment, ma'am. And she, she just went on. She was making up stuff. She's like, we, Lord, we thank you for the sandals. Lord, we thank. Yes, mama. Yes, yes. We thank you. <laughs> we thank you for the chairs. She went on so long that the finance woman left. <laughs> she just left. And then another woman who had been there earlier came, she came out and this woman looked very nice. Um, and so Red just addressed her as niece. She was like, hey, niece, hey, niece. And this woman was like, me? And Red called her over. She's like, hey, can you give me a ride home? And the, this way, like, she doesn't know her at all. And this woman was like, well, I mean, you're not leaving, right? Like, I'm, I'm leaving. I mean, I have some places I need to be. And Red is like, I'll just get your number. You can pick me up later. She's like, get, give me your phone. Give me your phone. And you don't argue with this woman. I would have given her my phone. I mean, you can't, you don't argue with a force of nature such as this woman. And so I'm hearing this behind me. I can't see them, but I hear this woman. I can hear the wheels in her brain turning. She's, she's thinking like, okay, how, how do I get out of this? And Red's just like, give me your phone. Give me your phone. So she puts her number in there. She's like, uh, she texted herself her, her own number. And then she's like, I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you and, and you can give me a ride. And she's like, because my mama said that that Jesus was going to work it out. Jesus was going to give me a ride home. So niece, I, I know that you're going to do it. And the woman just kind of walks out in a daze. So I think as we record this, I think niece is back at the ER picking up red. 
Um, I still want to know what was going on with the happy skipping one armed man. Yeah. I need to know if the baby was born. Did we have a boy or a girl? Did they ever get her intake information? I certainly <laughs> need to know if the kid with the broken arm was okay. So you understand, I don't want to be here. I need to be back with my people <laughs> in the ER. I need to understand how all of this turned out. Um, here was the apex of it. <laughs> So I had to do all my business here on a Friday for, from this emergency room. And um, th- there, was, there was a guy next to me. He had, it, he kind of looked like a gang member. Um, just, he had that look. I'm not trying to stereotype. It was just, you know, the teardrop tattooed under his eye. <laughs> Tattoos in English and Spanish. And I think the ones in Spanish, if I could... See, I, you know, they weren't like happy, you know, they weren't like nice <laughs> sentiments. Um, and so uh, he d- he just he had that vibe. OK, I'm not trying to stereotype. It was mainly the messages in his tattoos, um, you know, the knives going through skulls and whatnot. It just seemed I don't know. Maybe I'm stereotyping. OK, <laughs> so I'm sitting there in the ER talking to my husband and the guy next to me who looks like a gang member. It, he's suddenly giving me kind of a dirty look and I thought am I speaking too loudly I thought I was whispering (laughs) then I realized what I just said Caitlin here (laughs) my producer her name is Caitlin White when she comes over to do the podcast she brings her children I had been talking to my husband about the who which one of our kids were going to do spend the nights tonight and I had said I guess louder than I should have in that ER, I said to my husband, um, I only want the white kids to come over tonight. (laughs) And this man is staring at me. And it took me a second. So I I went on, I was like, no, I'm just, no, it's only the white kids. That's that's all I'm comfortable with. Because some of the other, some of my kids' other friends are a little, they're a little wild. They're fun, but they're very wild. So, so, what I said, because some of our other friends are, are wilder, I said, I, I'm only comfortable with the white kids being at our house tonight. <laughs> when I caught it, then I was yelling into my phone. I was like, yes, Caitlin White, Ms. White, Ms. White <laughs> will need to bring her friend's surname White, Caitlin White, uh, <laughs> as in the last name uh, White will need to bring her kids. <laughs> I lived a thousand lives. In that ER waiting room, there were highs, <laughs> yeah. there were lows, there there was you know the happy one armed man smiling and skipping. There was red praying <laughs> until until the the intake woman left. There there was there was the poor kids screaming in agony, and the entire ER waiting room rising up to get this kid the help he needed. This this was like. Les Miserables, literally nothing <laughs> happened, not only in that play, but in the entire French Revolution compared to what happened in this ER. Like, boring. Ooh, some people were beheaded. <laughs> nothing compared to what I saw in this ER this afternoon. So I just felt like, boy, did I have peace with like, oh, God has a plan for my life. I mean, if you had told me that I would spend an entire Friday afternoon at six hours in an ER, I would have been so mad. I would have said, man, that's not my plan. I need to get stuff done. I would have been so wrong. I was meant to be there. I was meant to be there with my people. I will remember all of those people forever. I, I love them so much. And um, so, yeah, sometimes, and, and here's the thing. If I had been resentful and stressed out about the use of time, I don't think I would have noticed some of this stuff. You know, if I had been anger scrolling on my phone, <laughs> I wouldn't have seen the one-armed man skip through, you know, skip past the woman screaming in labor. If I had, you know, just was like zoning out, playing angry music on my headphones and feeling sorry for myself and thinking, you know, thinking in circles about my problems and what I'm going to do with this situation. I mean, I, you know, I, I might not, have heard them tell the man who was visibly having a heart attack to just sit down and wait. I mean, I would have missed a lot of this stuff. And and so we really, we really need to remember this. When your plans get completely diverted, I've said before, make lore that that was actually that if you're interested in this subject, Caitlin, can you look up that the subject title was make memories. If you look that up on, um, 
on the Overcast mm-hmm. app. Um, the title was Make Memories, but it was really about look look at it like you're making lore. And and I was talking about let's say if you're doing a family vacation and it completely falls apart, you know, it, a huge storm comes in during your picnic or your wedding, you need to say the word lore. This is my lore. We're making lore. We don't make memories in this family. We make lore <laughs> uh, so do you have the episode no okay all right we'll find it <laughs> i don't have an account apparently oh I, I oh here I, you know what i'll just look it up i i'm i'm multi-talented <laughs> um so okay it is make memories yeah is what you called yeah it. 164 so episode 164 that is the one from july 12th 2023 make memories so if you're interested in that subject go look up episode 164 that's the mentality like making lore so that's easier to do if it is some if you are actively involved in something like again a, a tornado comes through on your wedding day that's lore it's hard to adopt that mentality when it's something like you're stuck in a line at the post office that's not lore. That's just annoying. But the thing is, anything can be lore when you live in the present moment and you trust that there is a plan here. Again, I could have put on my headphones and just anger scrolled TikTok and just been completely withdrawn and in my own head about how frustrating this is and this is just so annoying and I'm wasting a whole day in the ER. But because I was present, And I was calm and I just trusted that there was a plan here. And this took me years to develop. I mean, five, 10 years ago, I I would have just been angry and I would have missed all of it. But I've really worked on this. This has been one of my top priorities is to trust that there's a plan and just be as open and calm as possible when frustrating things like this happen. Because I was in that state, I ended up enjoying the heck out of my time. (laughs) In this waiting room. Oh, the other thing is because this hospital was so overcrowded and they were they were so crazy backed up, they were giving people diagnoses in the waiting room. And okay, and they said, so here were our choices. They could tell us the diagnosis in the waiting room, or if you wanted privacy, you had to step outside where it was (laughs) cold. And so this one lady was kind of elderly and she was like, you know, would you uh, you know, ma'am, Miss Ruth, would you like to hear your results privately? And she's like, yes, I believe I would. And she was like, okay, well, we'll just have to go outside. And like, she looked at the <laughs> wind and the rain, like, whoosh, you know, outside. She's like, oh, I guess I'll just hear it here. And they're like, okay, you're having a mild stroke. So, oh. <laughs> you know, you just have to wait 48 minutes and then we'll, we'll take you back. And I'm just like, what am I watching here? This is insane. So, um, I noticed all of this only because I was in that kind of trusting present mindset. So next time you feel frustrated, really try to believe that you were sent to this place for a reason. And even if it is the most banal, uninteresting, annoying thing, you literally have to mail a package and you are standing in line at the post office. For us ADHD people, there is truly nothing more exasperating and frustrating. Um... So, but even in those moments, if you calm down and you look around and you start noticing things about the people around you, I promise every time it'll get really interesting. That like, think of Sherlock Holmes. If you've ever read the Sherlock Holmes books or watched the TV series, he would always notice little things about people. Um, So like I would notice something like, The man sitting next to me, he was dressed nicely, but his hands were very leathery, like very, very, very worn. And so I thought that, okay, so I'm Sherlock Holmes. So what that tells me, he must have had some sort of very difficult, physically difficult outdoor job, but this is a really expensive suit he has on. So I was trying to imagine what his story would be. Start noticing stuff like that. What kind of watch is the guy wearing in front of you? What kind of shoes does he have on? Are there inconsistencies between... You know, his tattoos all have profanity on them, but then his necklace is of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, okay, well, seems like this guy's had some sort of conversion, you know? You you would be shocked at what you can learn about people when you Sherlock Holmes the situation and start noticing little details about the people around you. It's honestly shocking what you can figure out, and, and that will help you just be present. And then... 
when a one-armed man comes skipping through the post office and smiling, you won't miss it. And then you can wonder about that for the rest <laughs> of your life. Like, where where was he going? What was he doing? So, uh, <laughs> what a ride. What a ride. Okay, so now, let me get to the main topic. This is normally where I would promote... Um, what we have on this week's Village Hustle Patreon, but I haven't recorded it yet because that's what I was going to do while I was at the ER. I was supposed to do... That would have been funny. Oh, yeah, I should have. <laughs> I should... Oh, well, I am sorry. I, I apologize to all of you Patreon people. How funny would that have been if I recorded the Village Hustle Patreon from the ER with all of this... Chaos. With all of this going on in the background. Oh, oh, the woman read at one point. So she was sitting behind me, so I often couldn't see her. She was just doing her business. Um, she was d- doing some customer service calls, I guess, calling. Oh. She had to call insurance and, I don't, you know, the kind of thing where you have to sit on hold for a long time. Um, so she was on the phone with customer service and they were not being polite to her. I, I think they were kind of maybe talking down to her. And um, I hear her say from behind me, she's like, ma'am. I have been sitting in this ER for seven hours and I do not have time for this kind of attitude and negativity in my life. And I was like, that is, that's a mood. That, yeah. I appreciate that. And I, and I kept hearing her say that as she was talking to the customer service people. She's like, I ain't got time for this attitude and negativity in my life. And I was like, I, I'm so ready for her to be my life coach. Like, please sign her up immediately. Um, here is the main topic. Uh, I, I don't, I'll do the Village Hustle Patreon. The, okay, there will be one up. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I'm alive, <laughs> there, there will be. So you can look, say, oh, what was the Village Hustle Patreon for Monday? Patreon.com slash this is Jen. Um, so before I tell you how I got this diagnosis, um, l- let me emphasize, and I'm not trying to be a drama queen, but you just have to understand how seriously God swooped in in my life. What a what a big thing he did here. So uh, deep vein thrombosis, they're blood clots in major veins. If they break off, they can go to your heart, lungs, or brain. When they are the size of this one that I have, it's, it's very, very uh, long. And we actually can't tell how far it extends because we didn't we didn't do CT scans in all the right places. And I don't need any more <laughs> radiation. Have you ever had a CT scan, Caitlin? Nope. It's it's weird. They inject you with a dye that makes you feel like you have urinated on yourself. It oh. it produces such heat down there that you every time I think like did oh this is so embarrassing but <laughs> but I didn't. It just there's this it's this dye and it makes your whole body heat up and you might be able to see on YouTube if I look flushed. I actually don't have um I don't have blush on and I my my face is a little itchy. Um, it's from the they they inject they they send dye all through your veins in your body so that they can um, read the CT scan and it always makes me flush when I get that dye. It's very scary actually because mm-hmm. that you're in this big circular thing. Um, actually, Caitlin, if I text you a picture, can you can mm-hmm. you get it out? I, I actually took a selfie for you guys so you can see. Um, oh, I'm wearing the same shirt. So th- <laughs> I mean, this really shows. Can, can I? I'll, I'll airdrop it to your phone. How okay. about that? Yeah. Um, so, um, it, yeah, it's it's actually really, it's surprisingly scary getting a CT scan because you hear this whirring, this like deep in the machine and you're like in the circle and the machine is whirring and it's like, there's so much radiation and it's crazy. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, so DVTs, it, if they break off and I mean, it's, like I, I know, I know there are a couple of people, a couple of celebrities too, who, um, oh yeah, let's zoom yep, in more way. on my makeupless <laughs> face. Fantastic. There's a JF on YouTube.com. We do, we have a, wow, wow. I it regret this. <laughs> oh, that's all right. It's all right. Okay. We got, so everyone can see how my Botox is working, but here's what I love. This picture on YouTube, I'm wearing the same, like I definitely, <laughs> wait, 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 let me do the same Wait, Hang on. Wait. Okay. Wait. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Am I doing it? The little other, other head, uh, head the other way. No, other way. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing the same outfit, same hair. Um, okay, so that's a CT scan machine. So you go into the center of it. 
Um, and, and then there's this very deep whirring sound. Everything in you is like, this machine is about to blow me to smithereens. Like for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's surprisingly scary. Okay. So anyway, um, yeah, DVTs are, uh, there, it's like, if it stays a DVT, it's just, you know, it can be mildly painful or not or whatever, but, um, it, it, that's fine. If it stays a DVT. The problem is that's how you get pulmonary embolisms and, um, you know, it can go to your brain, it can go to your heart, it can go to your lungs, and that's how you get those deadly situations. It's it's usually a DVT that broke off. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a couple of celebrities. I used to think it was Fat Joe, and when I brought up the subject, I'd be like, you know, rest in peace, Fat Joe. Um, he's still alive, so that was awkward. <laughs> I thought he was like featured on a new song with Little Yachty or something. And I'm like, oh, well, good for him. Oh, my gosh. Yay. That's amazing. Maybe it was Big Pun. I, I think it might have been Big Pun. But th there are a couple of celebrities that um, they just drop dead. I mean, that that can happen. DVTs are very, very serious because when they dislodge, it it's not always. I mean, you could just have pulmonary embolisms like I had before and they can treat it. But if it hits wrong place, wrong time, it can be over. So, uh they're very it's a very 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 serious thing now here's another thing you need to know pulmonary embolism so that is blood clots that have already broken off and gone to your lungs they are diagnosed by ct scan that is what looks at your chest dvt is not diagnosed that way it's a whole separate thing that requires a whole different part of the radiology department it is diagnosed by ultrasound the same ultrasound they use to look at babies they use to check for dvts okay this is relevant listen all right now that you know that keep all that in mind let's take a journey back in time <laughs> shall we first of all you guys know that i was on my december bender that has a ring doesn't it my december <laughs> yeah. bender where my four food groups were Pims and Lemonade, Pims and Lemonade, Pims and Lemonade, and sugar. Um, <laughs> that was my food pyramid in December. Okay, so first of all, I could have totally beaten myself up about that. It, well, and I kind of did. But because I have learned that self-condemnation does not necessarily make you a good Christian. And in fact, we can end up in real spiritual messes when we make self-condemnation our immediate go-to. I have learned over the years the power of being on my own freaking side. As a Christian, too often it's tempting to just be like, I'm terrible, I'm a horrible human being. That's why I did that. When you stop doing that and say, Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not a horrible human being. Could I have possibly had a good reason for doing that? You might actually learn some really important stuff. And I learned something that saved my life. So I, so I, I, was, I was thinking, I thought, you know, I don't normally rely on sugar, carbs, and alcohol quite as much as I did in December. Like that's kind of extreme. And so I started thinking, like, am, am I covering for something? Because all of those things do give you energy. And when I would drink, I remember it would be like we had friends over. And these are people I like. And I don't want to just sit there and be sullen. And so I think, you know what? I'm going to have a Pims and Lemonade, which, by the way, is the most sugary drink. Like, literally the most. <laughs> like, more sugary than a pina colada. So that's kind of an interesting Sherlock Holmes clue there that the drink that I was so obsessed with is the most sugary one. And then alcohol is a sugar. So it's like, I mean, really, this was my version of doing cocaine. This was like the <laughs> suburban mom version of cocaine is sugar, carbs, and alcohol. And, and sometimes when you're looking, you're desperate for a boost. I mean, you kind of go to that. So no, do that meaning sugar and carbs and alcohol, <laughs> not the other. Um, so... I, yeah, I started to think, okay, maybe I'm not the worst human being in the world. Maybe I need to stop the habit of condemning myself every time something is wrong and also exploring the option that maybe not only did I do nothing wrong, but I had good motives behind this weird thing that I'm doing. 
Um, so I so I started to to think about that, and and I thought, okay, you know what? I, I'm going to start a, a diet. So meanwhile, I felt inspired to lose weight and lose weight quickly. I just did. I don't know, and and I'm I just I've gotten to the point in my life where it's like I'm not going to justify it. I don't care. Man, <laughs> back in the day when I was a, a young baby, a, a 32 year old baby, that's so young. When when I was young like that, I would have uh, well, a not told anyone, but b <laughs> I would have felt like I have to defend that. Like when well, you know, I am about my health, I do put my health first, but I just um, it's about fitness now. I'm like I don't care. I want to be thin. <laughs> I'm tired of being fat. I am tired of my jeans. When I button them, it is like a biscuit can opening <laughs> situation. Just like, you know, that. oh, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of looking like this. And I have the kibby dramatic body type. And we look really good when we are very much on the thin side of things. That's not true for everyone. Like the woman read in the ER, very, very voluptuous woman. She's a romantic body type. She looked incredible. She was like... Lizzo's gorgeous aunt like <laughs> unbelievable that she shouldn't try to be super thin that's not that's not her thing but it's my thing and 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 I do I feel like I look best when um when I'm on the thinner side of things and and I've just gotten unapologetic about that I might not always hit the goal but like yeah I want to be thin and I want to be thin fast because like it's hard to keep up with something when you're not seeing quick results <laughs> and I know but, oh my god these influencers who are like just do small habits every day small things <laughs> add up I'm like I don't have time in my life for that I have ADHD I'm not gonna do small habits every day because I will get so bored that I don't keep up with them they're like follow our plan and you can lose 0.01 pounds a week I have ADHD never going to happen if I am not losing an extremely dangerous amount of weight per week I'm not gonna stick with it I need to see results and I need to see results now and I'm not apologizing for that so that's the place that I was in um and I will say at the core there was a deeper inspiration one of the greatest gifts I have ever given myself that I cannot encourage you strongly enough to give yourself is to hone your gut instinct and to learn to distinguish when you are acting out of you know vain selfish like whatever motives and when it's something deeper it just, uh, it just feels right you can't put your finger on it but it feels right and here's the thing one of the keys way to, key ways to do that is to not beat yourself up so much when you do recognize the vanity because if 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 you're thinking about doing something and you realize yeah, I just kind of wanted to be flattered, to be honest. Like, <laughs> I just wanted for people to say that I'm hotter than my sister-in-law. And that was truly my only motivation. And it's because I didn't get enough attention as a child. And I'm just a really attention-seeking person because I have I have a hole where my heart should be. Um, it's just a lump of coal because that's kind of where <laughs> I am spiritually. Look, when you just acknowledge that and you don't spiral about it and you just say, uh, okay, there's some things that I need to resolve and, and I should I should repent. I should try to do better. I should confess my sins. I mean, all that, like acknowledge it, but not spiral about it. Just say, okay, yeah, yeah, I was, I was being vain. I really was. And I will try to do better next time, but I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm not going to say I'm a terrible person. I'm not going to feel depressed about it. And I'm dang sure not going to spiral. That allows you to hone your your gut instinct because then you have the emotional clarity that that you're not fearing that conclusion of like maybe it turns out I was being just vain in that situation Be, because if you flip out every time you come to that conclusion you'll stop asking the question does that make sense if you flip out every time you realize yeah I can I just had bad motives there I did mm -hmm. you'll stop doing this kind of discernment because it because that's an uncomfortable feeling so the more you can stop hating yourself and beating yourself up the more you will learn to listen to your gut instinct and the voice of god and there's nothing more important you can do in life this should be your top priority um because for reasons that you're about to hear so i had this inspiration to lose weight lose weight quickly 
do a somewhat extreme diet. Um, and yes, and, and and by the way, sometimes your motivation is both. A lot of it was vanity. I was like, I'm going to look so hot. My enemy's days ruined when I get on Instagram <laughs> stories. So yes, that was there. That was there. I need to work on that. Um, I was bullied as a child and I'm not over it. And my entire career is like trying to make up for that. <laughs> I acknowledge that. But I also recognized that very familiar feeling that my gut instinct and the voice of God, which sometimes I, I don't know how to explain which is which, but just that usually they're the same. Um, that side of things was leading me. It was like, yes, you need to do this. Like for other reasons, you need to do this. So I did this diet, the mystery diet that I've referenced. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I lost 10 pounds in a week. I know. Just uh, <laughs> You don't need to leave comments about this. I know. I know. You, you shouldn't lose 10 pounds in a week. I, some of it was water weight, to be honest. Some of it was water weight. I was not starving myself. I was not hungry. And I also wasn't doing keto. It wasn't keto. I was not starving myself. It was just it, the, the short version is it was like a cravings free diet. I got myself in a place where my body only, only, only wanted what it needed. So I had no cravings, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was watching my nutrition. I know a lot about this stuff. I've, I could seriously probably pass a master's exam on like nutrition. I've read so much about it. So that was a lot of weight to lose. Um, but <laughs> whatever, it's what I did. Um, so I was feeling great. I have, I have all my little health journals and all that. And, and I have these entries. I'm like, I haven't felt this good since I was, I didn't I didn't feel this good when I was 20 years old. I've never felt this good. But then 14 days into the diet, I suddenly felt really weird. And and, and it was strange because I hadn't changed the diet. I'd been on it 14 days. So it shouldn't be sugar withdrawal or anything. But I just felt weird. And what's interesting is in the last episode, episode what, 191? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, so right. I told the infamous Yacht Club trivia night story. <laughs> I'm still not recovered from that. <laughs> but what's interesting is you can ask our friends who were there, Amira, um, Stephanie, uh, Molly, Liv. The, I, I had to address this with them all. I said, uh, look, I don't know what's going on, but I, I am not well. Like something, something's not going well. And so I told them about the diet and I said, I, I did, <laughs> I lost 10 pounds in a week. <laughs> not bragging. <laughs> in fact, I, my theory was, uh, I said, I, I think I must have induced a vitamin deficiency. I was, <laughs> I was convinced because I'm, I'm, I'm um, reading a lot of historical um, stuff about uh, the Portuguese and their seafaring uh, empire. This is related. Hit the. It's related. I swear, but it sounds like a tangent, but it's not. That's our special sound effect for that. Because I'm reading a lot about 16th century seafaring, I was like, I bet I have scurvy. <laughs> I, I have scurvy because that's that's a vitamin C deficiency when you don't eat a lot of fruit. And that is the one thing in this diet because fructose, just, just read read about fructose. It can cause issues. So I was eating fruit, but not a lot of it. And I was like, I have scurvy. <laughs> so <laughs> in case you guys thought Jen's almost the craziest person I know, but I do know a schizophrenic person who is receiving inpatient care who is crazier <laughs> than Jen. Just so that I can take my rightful place as number one, <laughs> I want you to go back. Do me a favor. Go back and listen to episode 191, where I talked about the Hunger Games level chaos of Yacht Club Trivia Night. <laughs> now, I want you to hear all those stories, knowing now something I didn't say, that I was telling everyone at that table that I had scurvy. <laughs> I was yelling at my husband about the definition of macrame because to just recap, he almost lost us Yacht Club trivia night. The narwhals <laughs> almost took a, a, a disgusting second place because my <laughs> husband decided that he knew everything about knitting, like Betsy Ross over here lecturing the women about how <laughs> textiles work. Um, and we're like, it's macrame. And, the, and then all through all of this they're like Jen how is the scurvy doing so I so I thought that because this diet had worked so well it was like it it almost worked too well 
And the weird thing is, I was very careful about this diet. I was actually not playing fast and loose with my health. I very carefully looked at every single thing I was eating to make sure that I was getting enough nutrition. And, and I just thought it shouldn't, it, I think I'm getting enough vitamin C. Also, I was supplementing. I had a whole very custom list of supplements to make sure I got everything. And I was like, this is so frustrating that I have the pirate's disease because I <laughs> thought I was being so careful. And now I'm like, you know, a pirate, like I'm going to have a parrot on my shoulder and an eye patch and a peg leg because those are the only people who get scurvy. Okay, so um, this is where God starts coming into things. I didn't want to waste a doctor's time with all of this. So you can actually order your own blood tests. And and I thought, I'll see a medical professional if I need to. But if, if there's something really obvious, like a level is just like way off, let, let me just get some vitamin levels checked. And then I'll also make an appointment with the doctor because the doctors couldn't see me for a few days. So I just, you can do that. You can go just Google, like order your own labs. I don't recommend it. You should probably see a doctor, but I did it. So I just got my own blood test. I get the labs back. It turns out I didn't have scurvy, strangely enough. <laughs> um, all of my vitamins were perfect. So that was actually kind of encouraging. I was right. I, I nailed the supplements. My vitamin profile looked incredible. White, white blood cell count, great. Um, red blood cell count, great. Uh, there, there, there was one thing that was off that convinced me I had seven different types of cancer, <laughs> but either way, I was like, okay, now, now I just wanted quick results so I could see if there was something really obvious, but now I'll make an appointment with the doctor. That was God's first move. Everything on that exam was perfect, except for one metric that I found out later doesn't really matter and it's fine. It just kind of falsely looked off. If it weren't for that, that's where this would have ended. I, I would have just been like, uh, whatever. Um, so I, I went to the doctor to ask him about the metric that was off, which turned out to be a red herring. He's like, I, I couldn't care less. It doesn't matter. But I said, he said, what are your symptoms? And I said, I have shortness of breath. That That is, I said, it's a weird thing, um, but kind of suddenly, I've been short of breath. So I'm like babbling about my diet. I'm like, listen, I just, you know, the principles of it are, if you've ever read, this guy couldn't, I'm like the most <laughs> annoying patient he's ever had. He could not care less about my tortured thinking about my diet. It's, I mean, I stopped just short of being like, but these pants are fitting well, aren't they, doctor? I mean, like we're we're nailing it, right? <laughs> like, um, and he d couldn't care. I mean, he, he's a, an older gentleman, wonderful guy, just so not here for any of my crazy. And he just said, look, you have a history of pulmonary embolisms. And I know they thought that factor two would, you know, only cause blood clots during pregnancy, which by the way, that's why I wasn't on um, blood thinners because they thought that it would only cause problems during pregnancy. And I, I just, I don't take additional meds if I don't need to. And the only meds that don't ruin your life are like $700 a month. So yeah. for, for everyone who's like nay saying like, you should have been on blood thinners. Uh, okay, you want to send me $700 a month? It's not as simple as it sounds. So um, so I said, it, keep in mind that I had pretty serious shortness of breath. Um, so I told him that. Now, here's where some more details matter. This was this past Wednesday that I went to see him. Now, hit the stick with me sound effect. I need everyone <laughs> to pay attention so that you know how God worked in my life. Stick with me. That's our special sound effect to wake you up. Pay attention. <laughs> now, a few weeks before, I had scheduled a trip to Nashville the, because I need to edit my comedy special, which is the priority here. Like, let's all stay focused. Jen has a comedy special coming out in a couple months, and we're you know, <laughs> I need the money <laughs> from it doing well. So could we all please stay focused on the comedy special? So my record label, they suggested a date for me to um, go out there. And because multiple people need to be involved, normally I would just roll with that date. Um, but I, I ultimately decided, it, so... Actually, you know what occurred to me? Liz Bohannon, who wrote the book Beginner's Pluck, who is the most blessed person ever, the, the biggest juggernaut force of a woman I've ever met, 
she had also direct messaged me and said she might want me to speak at an event that, that would be the same day as the Nashville thing, but she wasn't sure. I'd totally forgotten about that, that Liz Bohannon sent me that message. So for that reason, and then also just this gut instinct reason, I checked in with God, I checked in with my gut instinct, and I said, should I accept this first date that my record label 800 Pound Gorilla has offered? It was a gut instinct thing. I thought, no, I, I, I think I should suggest another date. I never normally do that, especially when a large team of people needs to be involved. It's like they got together with their calendars. They figured out the date that works best. I, I'm one person. I always go with that. There was no reason I couldn't go out there that day. But with the Liz thing and all that, I said, you know what? Could we do it a different day, which was this coming Monday is when I was supposed to go to Nashville. Oh, this is getting complicated because by the time you hear this, it was the past Monday. <laughs> I'll give you guys dates. I was supposed to be in Nashville Monday, the January 29th. Okay. So you are, if you're hearing this on the day it comes out, we're at Wednesday, January 31st. Okay. So I felt moved. It was a gut instinct thing. Move it, suggest Monday, January 29th. What's crazy is as soon as I locked in the Monday, January 29th, 800 pound gorilla editing date, Liz Bohannon got back to me and was like, I'm so sorry, I didn't check with my team. They actually already had someone scheduled for this thing, I'm so sorry. You will see that that was a God thing. And that actually just occurred to me because that was part of the reason I moved the Nashville trip date. Okay, so we are now back at this past Wednesday, a week from before you're hearing this, Wednesday, January 24th. This is like a true true crime yeah, podcast. <laughs> okay. okay. Wednesday, January 24th, I go to the doctor. He says, I'm really concerned about your shortness of breath, the history of PEs, pulmonary embolisms. So he said, I am going to order you a CT scan of your lungs at our imaging facility. He was only ordering a CT scan of my lungs, lungs only, because I did not have any other symptoms. So he said, well, we'll do that. And he said, it's, it's Wednesday. We should be able to get you in um, sometime before Friday because this is urgent. I'll call them. I'll tell them that this is kind of an emergency. We suspect PEs. Again, people can die in literal seconds from PEs. So it's, it's almost similar to having a su suspected heart attack. It's almost at that level of seriousness if they suspect pulmonary embolisms. So a doctor calling an imaging center and saying, you have to get this woman in, it always works. It always works. It always works. This nurse called the imaging people multiple times. She tried so hard. She was on it. His, his nurse tried. It didn't work. She couldn't get me in. We had two full days. I said, I will clear off my calendar. I said, I will go to any imaging center within a two-hour drive. I was willing to drive two hours any time, Thursday or late Wednesday afternoon, Thursday or Friday, you name the place. I'll, you know, if it's San Antonio, I, I said, I'll go to San Antonio. It's not that far away. So uh, this, this nurse, she called me a couple of times. She's like, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I've never seen this. I mean, if we, if we say suspected PE, they can work someone in. I, I just don't know what's going on here. So finally, now we're at today, Friday, the twenty. Sixth. Okay, so now we're at today, Friday, this morning. So finally, I, I called the imaging place and I was like, I called them myself. I said, I will drive anywhere. I said, can you see, to the receptionist I was talking to, I said, can you see all of the imaging places that you guys work for? She's like, I, I can see, yes, a, like a large swath of the state of Texas, of our imaging centers. And this is a big chain. So I said, um, okay, I, I'll, I'll go anywhere get me in anytime and she said yeah i just i just can't she said but we can get you in monday if i had not had the nashville trip i would have wait i would have waited until monday because my shortness of breath was not that bad i have had serious pulmonary embolisms i could tell that this was definitely not that so i i, I was concerned but i wasn't like terribly concerned so she said, I, I got you down for Monday. We can do first thing Monday morning. And I, I paused and I was like, oh, I'm out of town. I can't. And by the time I got back from Nashville, because yet another thing that was kind of providential, 
I also felt moved gut instinct to see my stylist while I was out there. Sounds vain, right? Oh, Jen wants to see her stylist. That For those of us who just live in self-condemnation, oh, I shouldn't do that. That's spending money. That's being vain. What makes me think I deserve a stylist? I, I don't know, guys. I felt moved. I felt moved. Because of the appointment with the stylist, the stylist that extended my Nashville trip to the point that that was just getting too long to get into one of these imaging centers. If I had just done the editing, I could have made it back on Tuesday and I would have said, yeah, go ahead and just make me an appointment um, on Tuesday. But because I felt moved and I did not wallow in self-condemnation about my vanity and about wasting money, felt moved to make the stylist appointment that extended the Nashville trip too long that I said, "I, I just can't do it. With, with these imaging people because next Thursday is the earliest that I could get in. And even though I'm not super concerned, that's too long. Because of the place that I had put the Nashville trip on my calendar, I went to the ER. I want you to sit with this for a second because it's going to blow your mind when you realize <laughs> what God did for me. Hit the, it's going to blow your mind, special sound effect. Hit the everyone convert to Catholicism immediately because the Catholic God does things for people. Sorry, Caitlin, you you have to become Catholic after you hear this. (laughs) I only went to the ER because of time, because of the Nashville trip. That is the only reason I went there. It wasn't really that urgent. They're just the only people who have a CT scan machine that I could access before I went to Nashville. So I just casually went there and I was like, I, I just, I have to check this box before this long Nashville trip. Um, so I'm just going to go to the ER. The ER ordered a DVT of my leg. The doctor did not. If I had not had this Nashville trip planned when I did with the meeting with the stylist, which extended it, I would have gone to the regular imaging center where only a scan of my lungs was ordered. I don't have symptoms of a DVT in my leg. My leg seems fine to me. I occasionally notice mild, a mild feeling of kind of tension or pressure and that's it. This DVT is very long and thin. It's not blocking blood flow. It's asymptomatic. So when it breaks off, it becomes a torpedo that heads straight to your heart and lungs. You don't usually survive if one of these breaks off. Because it's rare to have asymptomatic DVTs, and I, because I had one that had symptoms, and they were insane. Most pain I've ever been in in my life, other than childbirth, was <laughs> the DVT in my leg. So normally they have crazy symptoms. It's rare to have an asymptomatic DVT. Because I didn't have symptoms in my leg, my doctor didn't order an ultrasound of my leg. My lungs are fine. I don't have pulmonary embolisms. So if I had not scheduled this Nashville trip when I did, I would have gone to the imaging center where only a CT scan of my lungs was ordered. They would have said, yeah, we don't know what's causing the shortness of breath. I would have left and I would have been walking around with a ticking time bomb in my leg that if and when it broke off, fairly likely chance that I would like die in seconds and people have had, I you know it's common enough you guys might know people who have died of that that's how it happens you have an asymptomatic DVT and it it hits your heart before you know anything's wrong I, I'm sorry to the hypochondriacs they're like <laughs> asymptomatic what I don't I have any here. symptoms <laughs> what what deep vein thrombosis like they don't have symptoms I don't have symptoms I think I have that <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. I'm sorry. I'm going to the ER tomorrow, so it's fine. Yeah, this is not (laughs) helping the hypochondriacs. Um, So first of all, I don't, I still don't know why I have shortness of breath. They're like, we we didn't see pulmonary embolisms. Um, 
But let's look at the chain of what happened here. I refused to feel guilty about the fact that I wanted to lose weight quickly. Because I did that, that revealed how exhausted I was. Here's the thing. I think that this exhaustion has something to do with this DVT. We think it probably actually extends into my pelvis, but they didn't do a CT scan of that, so we don't know. Um, surely my exhaustion has something to do with, uh, with this because I've had so many blood tests in the past three days. We've checked for everything. We checked thyroid. like We checked everything. Everything is perfection. So I think what has been happening is this DVT has been building probably for a couple of months. I think that's why I was eating so many sugar and carbs in December because I was trying to cover over my exhaustion. Um, so then because I didn't beat myself up about my very strong inspiration to lose weight quickly, that put me on a timeline to quickly start figuring out what was wrong with my health. If I had done the atomic habits system, how great is this? How great is this? Not listening to atomic habits influencers <laughs> literally saved my life. It literally saved my life. I would literally be dead if I listened to atomic habits podcast bros. This is the greatest coup of my entire <laughs> life. It all comes together. It all. Oh, my entire existence just synthesized into one <laughs> glowing hole. The w H O L E, not H O L E. It, 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 my entire existence just synthesized into perfection. <laughs> I, it saved my life not to listen to these people because if I had done the whole, like, I'm going to have my, I'm, small changes add up to big, if you make a 1% change, if you make, if you make a 1% change over a long period of time, those results add up. I'd be dead, literally dead, if I followed that advice because mm -hmm. I would have lost weight so slowly that it would have taken a long time to reveal the exhaustion I was feeling. Also, I would not have suspected that it had anything to do with my diet, like that there was anything urgent, but because I had just done something very dramatic by losing 10 pounds in a week, I thought, okay, I screwed this up. Like, I, okay, okay, I lost weight too quickly. What did I do? You know, was it bad for my kidneys? Or like, what did I do? I don't really have any serious symptoms. I have some shortness of breath, nothing in my legs. And that's really it. And I just thought I had scurvy because I was like, well, <laughs> I mean, I know that shortness of breath isn't a huge symptom of scurvy, but listen, you know, I, I think it's that. Um, but... I don't have severe symptoms. And so it was only because I had just done something very dramatic that I worried that I had messed something up and I sought medical treatment. You know, we're, we're busy people. Listen, if you have ADHD and are busy and are a hypochondriac, look, you can't get every medical thing checked out. We would literally live in the emergency mm -hmm. room. You know, I mean, you, I, I, I think there is, I'm all about like be safe with your health. But look, <laughs> when you're a hypochondriac, I'm also all about, at some point you have to live your life. Mm -hmm. And if I had not just done something so drastic with my health, I would have just been like, eh, I'm a little short of breath, but I think it's allergies. Austin is a, a really bad allergy city. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think I'm just like, because my husband has allergy issues. Like I, I think it's, it's just allergies or maybe it's, you know, long COVID or something like that. Um, so that inspiration and the fact that I didn't second guess my desire to lose weight quickly was the first thing that started this life-saving domino effect. And then the second thing was, well, well, first of all, that I even went to Nashville. Because one thing to know, my record label is not paying for me to go because I don't have to go out there. We could do this remotely. And so, so they said, that's fine. You don't have to come out. But some people like that in-person connection. Here's another example of where self-condemnation or rejecting instantaneous self-condemnation saved my life. I just wanted to go to Nashville. I like being in Nashville. I have friends there. I like 
sitting in hotel rooms. There is a Holiday Inn in Nashville that I literally, and I am not exaggerating, like way better than Ritz-Carlton hotels. I love this Holiday Inn so much. I like my friends in Nashville. I like doing comedy at Zany's in Nashville. I just wanted to go. And I'm not making a ton of money right now. So that expense to do the airfare and hotel, it was one of those things like, okay, we can do it. But the comedy millions aren't here just yet, if you know what I mean. It's like one of those, uh, It's I could do it, but it is kind of a stretch. Um, but the fact that I, I didn't, I, I no longer just instantly self-condemn. And I just thought, you know what? I feel moved. I feel moved. And, and as part of this uh, exploration of not instantly self-condemning, I've also done a lot of work of not being so attached to things, not obsessively needing things to make me happy. I've done a lot of that kind of deep work. You can listen to um, Summer of 2022. Those podcast episodes from Summer of 2022, I went into a lot of like the doctors and the hippies that I saw that helped me with that kind of thing. And so I've gotten to a point where if I feel like God and my gut instinct are telling me to do something, I just don't worry too much that this is me being, you know, obsessive or needing to fill some hole within me or, you know, something like that. Um, and so um, I, I just didn't feel guilty about it. I was like, I want to go to Nashville because I want to go to Nashville because it sounds fun. I just do. And so I'm doing it. And then I felt inspired to make it this date. And then I also felt inspired. I want to meet with the stylist. I like her a lot. She seems like a great human being. I've never met her in person. I don't know. I just feel moved. I guess it's self-indulgent. It's it, like I'm paying her for the session. It's not free. It adds a fair amount of expense to the trip. I don't know. I just want to do it. And because of the way that extended the timeline... That is how I ended up getting the ultrasound of my leg that only the ER would have ordered because my regular doctor, for, for great reason, I don't blame him for this at all. I have no symptoms. Um, he did not think I need an ultrasound of the leg. And, and I so didn't think I needed it that I almost declined it at the ER, which by the way, goes back to being in the present moment. If I had been stressed out and and if I were pushing against this use of time. Like, I cannot believe I'm sitting in this waiting room for six hours. I have so many other things to do. And like, the house is going to be getting crazy and Joe's going to be mad. And if I had been in that mode, I think I might have declined the ultrasound of my leg because every test they did, they'd take you back and then send you back out to the waiting room. Uh, by the way, you can see here. Oh, oh, look, I still have my medical. <laughs> has this been on? Like, yeah. it's, it has my social security number on it. So. We haven't she okay. shown it. All right, Caitlin, we, we'll look at the footage and yep. make sure that, okay. <laughs> so you can, let me see. All right, I don't want to show you. You can see, I still have my medical bracelet on. And then look, I still have, there's, yeah, there's some, oh, look, this is, oh, they did an EKG. You can see JF oh, on <laughs> YouTube.com. I still have the EKG sticker on my arm. And then, and then my arm is all bandaged up. This is a heck of a bandage. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, from the, from the, um, where they put the um, IV in. They almost had the med student like, oh, let's learn. <laughs> <Final> <laughs> let's <last> learn. <laughs> um, so... Um, if I had been in that state of not trusting that there's a plan for me and there's a plan for me being here and getting all invested in the many, many plot lines of this ER, I would have turned down the ultrasound of my leg because it did add probably 90 minutes to my visit. And I, if I had just been in that place of like, I've got to get home, i got to get home. I shouldn't be taking this much time. Jo Joe might be mad and the house is going to be a mess and, and the kids are going to be frustrated. I would have turned down the ultrasound of my leg. But because I was in that place of trust and knowing that there was a plan for me and I'm just going to build my lore and watch all these other people's lore, <laughs> I just went with it. I was like, okay, that's fine. I, we can waste time on an ultrasound of my leg. Literally saved my life. Literally saved my life. Because I keep in mind, guys, I work out with a trainer now. I mean, to be bouncing around with a trainer with a DVT that goes all the way from my knee up to we know it goes up to where my leg connects with my pelvis but we think it's probably in the pelvis too but we just can't see because we didn't do a ct scan um 
ask a medical professional how bad that is if you don't want to take my word for it. Um, they'll probably gasp when you describe it. And I would have been walking around with that thing, not knowing it, if I had still been in the habit of self-condemnation and thinking that everything I'm inspired to do that is remotely just kind of fun for me and sounds right must be bad. If I were in a habit of self-condemnation, I, I don't know how else to say this, guys. I think it would have cost me my life. I'm serious. Well, it might. I mean, like I might. We, this episode's not over yet. We have a good 30 <laughs> seconds left. At least I got all this out, you know. Um, so if you've ever listened to me on anything stop condemning yourself stop thinking that everything you want to do is wrong it because one day quite literally loving yourself and realizing that you probably have great motives the vast majority of the time and it's okay to do things that just feel good and sound fun for you and just kind of feel right getting to that place might one day literally save your life no one's ever going to beat this episode. This is <laughs> the best podcast episode that's ever been created. If you guys don't share this, like, I, just, I just don't know what you do. I don't know what you want from me. If it's not doing a podcast, <laughs> like put up that picture one last time, like two seconds after I left the ER. All right. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>